Just like new Pokémon trainers, Attack on Titan's new recruits have to choose between three options. After they complete their training, they can opt to either join the Survey Corps, the Garrison, or the Police Brigade. Of course, A-plus students get first picks. Gotta earn your badge, trainee. Attack on Titan is filled with logos and emblems, each having their own unique signification. In this video, I'll get my iconography lens on and find the meaning behind the various military emblems, the wall logos, and the Eldian armbands recently introduced in the anime. Welcome to Dr. Grisha Yeager's study. Please have a seat and grab a looking glass if needed. The first item on today's list is the rather dull-looking Training Corps emblem. Unlike the other military emblem, which I will analyze later, this one lacks color and is a bit more static in its organization. The whole thing is basically two swords clashing in front of an oversized gray shield. If you think about it, the emblem's lack of personality represents very well its recruits, or at least the fact that they are trying to make soldiers out of them. Of course, the Training Corps trainees are far from being blank slates. Just think about that funny scene where Sasha got her Potato Girl nickname. What I am getting at here is that Chief Instructor Chavez's goal is exactly to turn them into blank canvas in order to prepare them for a life in the Army. Members of the Training Corps are expected to graduate three years after the beginning of their training, and will be dispatched within the military's three main divisions – the Survey Corps, the Garrison, or the Military Police Brigade. All these sectors come with different levels of dangers, requiring various skills. That's why the most brilliant students that make the top 10 are allowed first pick in choosing which division they want to join after graduation. As I will explain later, joining the Military Police Brigade seems to be the wisest and safest choice amongst the three. Interestingly enough, only Annie Leonhardt, who made it to the top of the class, joined the division, while everyone else chose to venture outside the walls with the Survey Corps. Which one would you have picked? The Garrison is where all the C-plus students go. Having a way lower fatality rate than the Survey Corps, and being less picky about who enters their ranks, the Garrison is the largest faction of the military. Their goal is basically to maintain and protect order within the walls. Their emblem illustrates two red roses that seem to bloom on the gray shield found across all the military division's emblems. The flowers, which are probably some sort of nod to wall rose, also represents the blooming lives that the Garrison has vowed to protect within the giant walls. The fact that garrison members can be found pretty much everywhere within the walls makes them quite versatile in terms of skills. They are proficient in titan combat when they need to defend the people within the walls, and are trained in using cannons and rifles. They also provide security within the population and control crowds in case an evacuation is needed if there is a breach in one of the walls. The Military Police Brigade is the most prestigious of all three military sectors, but also the most rotten. Members of the MPB have been seen drunk on the job, chilling out and giving all the work to the freshly graduated recruits. On their emblem, we can find a mythical green unicorn with white flowing hair, and a sharp and long horn aimed at the sky. This somewhat pompous symbol represents perfectly the huge ego its members have. While they rarely use vertical maneuvering equipment, since the chances they encounter titans are slim, they carry firearms wherever they go. One of the main tasks of the police brigade is to act as royal guards, but they are also in charge of land distribution and tax collection. These precious unicorns live safely within Walshina. While they were the creme de la creme during their prime, most military police officers, besides maybe Levi's former trainer Kenny Ackerman, have become rather useless when facing a real threat. As seen when Aaron and Annie were fighting in the Stoas district, these fancy soldiers have no idea what to do when faced with titans. They basically become big, fat, overfed cats with too much power. Well, power over humans. They're pretty much easy snacks to pure titans. The Survey Corps emblem is one of the most recognizable logos in the entire series. For one of its, the lead character's branch emblem, and Survey Corps members were one of the most cosplayed character types in anime and manga conventions around the time the first season aired. The emblem consists of two large wings, one white and the other blue, that seems to burst in front of the military shield emblem. The emblem is one of the most dynamic of the bunch as it seems there is movement within the wings maybe representing the nature of the job. The Branch's soldiers are the most active when it comes to fighting titans. They roam outside the walls in planned expeditions, dangerous ones at that. 
While a lot of their members never return home, they keep on going as their insignia symbolizes hope and is known as the Wings of Freedom. In short, their goal is to reclaim what has been taken from humanity, whatever that may be. Besides being agile fighters, the Survey Corps is also tasked to learn more about Titan biology. Their research efforts are mostly overseen by the eccentric Hanje Zoe, who later became the 14th commander of the Survey Corps, succeeding Erwin Smith, who fell in an epic battle in the Shiganshina district. With about only 300 members, the Survey Corps is the least popular military branch in terms of enrollment since it's also the most dangerous of the three. The next emblem on the list is the one regrouping all of them, and is rarely seen outside Walshina, or at all for that matter. One character who wears it proudly is the general of the three military branches, Commander-in-Chief Darius Zackley. Being the big boss of the Survey Corps, the Garrison, and the Military Police Brigade, his emblem is the simplest of them all. A gray shield in the anime, or a black one in the manga. It's basically the original design without the roses, unicorns, or wings. While the gray version found on the anime is kind of boring to be honest, I find the black shield drawn in the manga quite powerful. While the shield's contours and the cross in the middle are gray, what is between them is a striking pitch black. It kind of makes the emblem more authoritative and powerful, and perhaps a bit evil if I dare say. After all, we are talking about the man who helped overthrow the government, and who has a weird chair which I should not and will not describe in this video. If you know, you know. Just like the military's emblems, the logos representing each wall uses a gray shield as background. The lines which form a cross inside the shield are black instead of another shade of gray, and is contoured by a thick outline with the words Wall Maria written on top of it. I have a feeling that this shield-shaped frame represents the strength of the walls themselves, as it seems that the silhouette of Maria within the emblem is protected by these. Let's now take a look at Maria herself. Her face is emptied of any detail and drawn from the side, and we can notice she wears some kind of crown. Some believe that she represents a saint, in this case, Saint Mary. To some extent, this theory makes sense, since if we take into account while Maria protects the whole nation as a mother would, but also since a whole religion, which I will discuss in more detail soon, literally worships the three walls. The actual origin of the girl portrayed on the emblem is the one of Maria Fritz. Does the name Fritz ring a bell? Maria is a direct descendant of King Carl Fritz, who sealed its own people within the walls on Paradise Island. This whole Titan mess began around 2,000 years ago, when a man who only goes by the name King Fritz gave birth to three daughters, and the rest is history. While Wall Maria is best known as the first wall to be breached by the Colossus and Armor Titans in Shiganshina District, the second one, Wall Rose, is best known by viewers and readers alike for the Battle of Trost District. Standing tall right in the middle of human territory, between Wall Maria and Wall Sheena, Wall Rose acts as a second barrier against Titan invasion. The Wall Rose emblem is quite similar to Wall Maria's, while featuring another long-haired girl wearing a different type of crown. The girl is no other than Rose Fritz, Maria's younger sister, and King Fritz's second daughter. Not only are the girls portrayed in these emblems of royal blood, but they are also Emir's daughters. Those girls were the direct inheritors of the founding Titan, and are responsible for creating the other eight Titans. As we have seen with the Rice family, the power of the Titans is not inherited through blood, but through consuming the host's spinal fluid. And this is exactly what King Fritz forced his daughters to do after Emir passed when she protected the king from an incoming spear thrown by an enemy. Talk about awful parenting. The emblem representing the smaller wall, Wall Sheena, represents Emir's youngest daughter, Sheena Fritz. The emblem is quite similar to the other two walls, the only two differences being the name of the wall and the image of the princess. Wall Sheena is believed to be the safest place on Paradise Island. That is, when the female titan is not crashing the party in Soas District. Wall Sheena is home for the most wealthy members of society within the walls, but also home of the Church of the Wall, also known as the Wall Cult or Worshippers. These fanatics basically believe that the walls are sacred and should never be altered. 
Of course, as we learn when Pastor Nick was introduced to the show, this is all lies. The true intent of the religious group is to keep hidden the real history behind the walls. As it was revealed, the walls are actually made out of titan-hardening material, while its inner pillars are slumbering colossus titans. Tons of them. They also believe that the walls were created by some kind of unseen being they refer to as the Divine Architect, which is probably just a nickname for King Carl Fritz. Now let's get out of the walls and take a look at other emblems associated with Eldians. While there are other internment zones housing Eldians elsewhere, the final season introduced us to the world of Liberio. The city surrounded by tall fences and supervised by Marlian authorities was the hometown of Eren's father Grisha Jaeger, but also the one of warriors such as Reiner. The Eldians are kept from leaving their zone without special authorization, and a large wall with a gate separates their area from the other ones. Getting out without proper authorization can cost an Eldian their life if caught by the public security authorities, as Grisha sadly learned when he lost his little sister. Fay. Now, how does the Marley police distinguish Marleyans from Eldians? Well, the answer is rather simple. They mark them by making them wear an armband with what can be called an Eldian star printed on them. The star, which looks more like an explosion, has nine branches and is easily recognizable, making Eldians easy to spot. But that's not all. The Marleyan government created a hierarchical system ranking people with Eldian blood with colors. The most common one out of the four is of a brown grayish tint and represents normal civilians. Compared to the other three armbands who have white Eldian stars, the star is of a dull dark brownish gray. You can spot one on Grisha during flashbacks on his childhood. You probably spotted the Grey Eldian armband during the Battle of Fort Slava in the first episode of the new season. While the manga uses the same armband color for its civilians and soldiers, the anime thought it was important to make a sharp distinction between the two. But make no mistake, while the fighting Eldians have a different armband than civilians do, they are not treated any differently, and maybe even worse. Marleyan generals have been known to send groups of Eldian soldiers to the front lines, using them as shields against the Mideast allied forces, or as I like to call them, Meef. As you have seen in the episode, The Other Side of the Sea, shackled Eldians are thrown out of a Zeppelin blimp and right into the heart of battle on Fort Sleva. What happens next is rather shocking, as Zeke, the inheritor of the Beast Titan, uses his Scream ability to transform these poor souls into pure Titans, using them to fight their enemies. While the Meath had quite an advantage at first, having heavy artillery even capable of piercing the Armor Titan, Marley ended up winning the battle. But at what cost? Wearing an Eldian Grey armband is almost as bad as running around the Titan-infested fields of Paradise Island without a fast horse. Before Reiner, Annie, and Berthold attacked Wall Rose and infiltrated both the Survey Corps and the Military Police Brigade, they proudly wore the yellow Eldian armband. As we have seen with Gabby, Falco, and their little gang, this armband is reserved for the Warrior Unit candidates. A bit like the Training Corps students, these trainees go through rigorous training and studies in hopes of being chosen to inherit the power of a Titan, or at least what's left in Marley's collection. The main goal of most candidates is to eventually become what they call a warrior, which would grant their families the honorary titles of Marleyans. This is basically the only way for Eldians to gain some kind of respect from the authorities, but it's also really hard to attain. The selection process is hard to pinpoint, as it seems candidates for the role of warriors are chosen depending on how their actions and personalities match with the nature of each Titans. Of course, skills and brains are taken into consideration, but Reiner got the armor titan over Porco Galliard back in the day because of his undying perseverance, while Porco had better grades all around. Of course, Marcel, who got eaten by Ymir quite fast, had a thing or two to do with his brother not being selected as one of the warriors. In today's video's last entry, I want to talk about the Red Eldian Armband. This white-starred red armband is the most prestigious thing an Eldian could ever accomplish within the Marley Empire. It is also shared with each warrior's family members, granting them the title of Honorary Marleyans. The main mission of the latest warrior unit was to locate and acquire the founding titan within the walls. In order to do so, Annie, Reiner, 
Berthold and Marcel set out to Paradise Island. While Marcel did not make it far, the other three used the powers of their titans to breach Wall Rose through Shiganshina District, triggering the events that unfolded throughout the series. As you probably know by now, their initial mission was a failure, and they lost not only one, but two titans in the process. Annie, holding the power of the female titan, is still trapped in her crystal, while Berthold, well, has been fed to Armin, who now holds the powerful Colossus Titan. There were some interesting things about how the series would end in the comments of our Eren vs. Annie video. Some of you seem to want an ultimate showdown between Eren and Mikasa. While it would be epic for sure, how do you think that would turn out? 